Maybe you should stop obsessing about your own and other people's sexuality. Hmm, maybe not. If I could say anything about Disco Elysium, it would be that it can be a surprisingly difficult game to talk about. It may have some of the most acclaimed writing in the entire medium, with a story that walks the fine line between formulaic linearity and open-ended, player-driven narrative while managing to be at points insightful, poignant, bizarre, and genuinely funny, but damned if that density doesn't make it a daunting subject for a video essay. I imagine that there's also the matter of wanting to avoid spoilers, because as pretentious as it may sound, Disco Elysium is one of those games that you really have to experience for yourself. As such, if you're concerned about spoilers, I can say that while I will be discussing much of the game in depth, the murder mystery that serves as its nominal main plot isn't terribly relevant to what I want to talk about today. That being, as you can tell from the title, the queer content of Disco Elysium. If you're at all familiar with some of my other videos on similar subjects, I do need to point out that my intention here is going to be a bit different. Disco Elysium is not the sort of game that dabbles in light subtext and plausible deniability. Quite the opposite, in fact. The protagonist is a repressed bisexual man, and various other characters are either explicitly or implicitly queer themselves, and their queerness informs the ways in which they engage with their richly developed world. Pointing that out here, as I've done in videos on other games, wouldn't be terribly original or useful. There's absolutely nothing wrong with enjoying these characters simply as they are, of course, and transformative fandom has indeed taken notice of this game, which I am not criticizing whatsoever. However, Disco Elysium very much wants to say something about the world it's depicting. It asks us to consider, and to play with in the way that we shape the main character's personality, skill set, and beliefs, a variety of philosophical and ideological positions in a world similar to, but not quite the same as our own. This is most directly addressed in gameplay via the four political alignments that the detective can explore, but the game's branching dialogue trees contain all sorts of ruminations on the diverse population of the charmingly ruined city of Reroshul. Race, class, gender, religion, political affiliation, and, yes, sexuality, all that variety is accounted for here in one form or another, inviting the detective, and the player, to observe the state of the world of Disco Elysium while you're out solving a mystery and also trying to put your life back together. It's a wild ride, and this is a game notorious for its outlandish tangents, but let's have some fun with it. Even better if you can find someone else preferably a large man dressed in nothing but a towel, to thrash you while you're spread naked and helpless on a cool slab. There's no better place to begin, I think, than with the detective at the center of this story. Harry Dubois is a complete mess of a human being, truly the poorest little meow meow in all of fiction, and we don't even need Tumblr to tell us that. The detective's chronic insecurity over his own sexuality is represented in-game by one of the thoughts that he can internalize, when an encounter with a male escort prompts him to ponder the homosexual underground. This entry in the thought cabinet only scratches the surface, though. Disco Elysium freely plays around with conventions common to the noir genre to illustrate exactly how much its detective is not the Dick Mullen type that he aspires to be. The game features a classic noir femme fatale, and while the detective has a, well, you can't call it a romance, but he has something with her, Klasha never becomes a part of the story's core emotional stakes. Instead, the detective is torn between two other characters who represent the stages of his development, each of which is pulling from their own literary tropes. On the one hand, he's consumed with self-loathing and regret over the deterioration of his relationship with his ex-wife, 
The detective builds her up in his mind as an unreachable, almost religious figure, a lost Lenore of sorts who drives him to seek oblivion through substance abuse as the only way to ignore the pain of her absence. Except that, you know, she's still alive. She just left him, and he's depressed and being overly dramatic about it. On the other hand, however, there's the reality of the detective's present, with his fellow police officers pushing him to clean up his act and actually do his job. The buddy cop genre, in its traditional form, is a celebration of platonic and ostensibly heterosexual male friendship. Disco Elysium leans into this genre expectation right up front, with the tagline, What kind of cop are you? and the cover art featuring the detective and his partner Kim Kitsuragi side by side. The game doesn't stick to that script for very long, though. There's, to be sure, the detective's eroticized fascination with the hedonistic disco star Guillaume Le Million, as well as his fixation on the sexualized male body. But more simply, Kim is gay, and very matter-of-fact about it, too. The detective's relationships with his fellow cops become central to his current reality, not just with Kim, but also, to a lesser extent, with his former partner Jean Vigmar, who occupies a narrative space akin to an ex-lover. They're the ones driving him to, if not completely overcome his depression, then to at least set aside his pain so he can focus on the case. The women in the detective's life aren't irrelevant to his emotional development, but they are kind of fake-outs for the audience. No matter the choices the player makes, the detective can never convince his ex not to leave him, nor can he initiate anything genuine with Klasha. But he can spend much of his time seeking Kim's approval, prod him into dancing, and even dedicate a song to him. It must be said that Disco Elysium never becomes a game about relationship building, but nonetheless, Kim is the only character to merit this kind of development, with his ability to participate in the game's final sequence in part depending on how close he and the detective have become over the course of the story. Leaving aside the obvious shit fodder, though, the detective's anxieties over his sexuality are often just as revealing. There are multiple dialogue options strewn throughout the game that allow him to express homophobia along with other forms of bigotry, often to a comically exaggerated degree. This is particularly true if the detective explores the fascist political alignment, which has a good deal of fun lampooning the insecure masculinity and homoerotically tinged rhetoric that frequently characterize such movements in real life. There's also the matter of censorship. Disco Elysium has no shortage of foul language. Even a single conversation with Kuno will attest to that. But for the most part, it never pulls any punches when it comes to obscenities, whether simple insults or in-universe racial slurs. There is, though, one word that is always censored in-game, both in the text and in the audio. It's loving in the dick! The absence of any other profanity filters calls attention to this one in particular especially since it extends to, of all things, an inventory item with a label that carries certain additional implications that I'm probably not supposed to talk about on YouTube. The censorship feels deliberate, not just on the part of the developers, but on the part of the protagonists through whom this story is being filtered. We already know that the detective struggles to reckon with uncomfortable aspects of his life, as that's the reason for the days-long drunken bender that causes him to forget nearly everything about himself at the start of the game. It's not much of a stretch to imagine that this particular dialogue quirk is a manifestation of the same difficulty that the detective has with recalling his most painful memories. While the story is never about the detective's love life, except perhaps in the most abstract sense, it's easy to read his numerous sexual anxieties as yet another obstacle that he must overcome in order to reach self-actualization. Or, in other words, a good ending. It's an optional element, to be sure, in the same way that much of the game's content is optional when it comes to its variable outcomes, but it's another facet of the detective's fragmented psyche that Disco Elysium encourages you to explore 
Sometimes it's heartwarming, sometimes it's utterly deranged. But that's just the kind of guy Harry Dubois is. Everything will be constantly shifting and moving under our rule. The future will belong to a circus of identities just spinning around, surreal and unreal. You won't even know who you are anymore. The detective fits in quite well with the similarly colorful residents of the derelict district of Martinez, which serves as a fitting backdrop for a man stumbling his way toward rediscovering himself. I confess that I have a certain familiarity with the setting of Disco Elysium, even though the parallels between Revachol and my own city of New Orleans are likely unintentional on the part of the developers who pulled from their experiences in the former Soviet bloc. Both cities are cosmopolitan ports that have seen better days, and both display an abundance of French influence, or Disco Elysium's in-universe equivalent. Revachol is even a colonial city as well, particularly uncommon in fictional settings given the amount of necessary world-building involved, and that produces a messy intersection of cultures and competing political and economic interests. It's a sort of environment, in short, where limited legal oversight and a lack of a clearly conservative status quo would feasibly encourage a thriving queer subculture. That's certainly the case in New Orleans, but of what we see in Martinez? While there's no shortage of casual homophobia among some of the residents, it's harder to find any clear evidence of legal prohibitions against queer sex acts or non-normative gender presentation even when all of the game's dialogue involves police officers in some way. Two girls kissing on the cover of a magazine read by a store clerk suggest more or less the opposite, in fact, if only in the most shallow and commercialized of ways. There's still much to be said, however, for the power of social stigma, and how the two most prominently queer NPCs in the game are both outsiders knowingly conforming to stereotypes. First is the young man, known only as the smoker on the balcony, who prompts the detective to contemplate the homosexual underground. Although he plays coy about his sexuality and the nature of his relationship with his so-called Sunday friend, the smoker functions as a recognizable send-up of gay hustler culture. His flippant attitude and light flirtations with the detective are as carefully constructed parts of his image as the decor in his apartment, complemented by gifts from the Sunday friend. The smoker is, in essence, exaggerating the appearance of a sex worker carrying on an illicit relationship with a wealthy and well-connected man. That's exactly what he is, of course, although it takes some work for the detective to figure that out, unsurprisingly with how much the man is repressing his own feelings on the subject. Secondly, we have the lorry driver, Ruby. Even though Ruby is central to the core mystery of Disco Elysium, she's only encountered once fairly late in the story. Much of what the detective learns about her comes through other characters, whether that's her fellow drivers or the gang of dock workers calling themselves the Hardy Boys. Ruby is a butch lesbian who has become a friend of the gang precisely because she can match their hyper-masculine image and operate as one of the guys. While the smoker leans into the seedy reputation of the sex worker lifestyle, Ruby navigates homophobic prejudice by embracing a gender presentation that allows for some permissiveness regarding her attraction to women. This naturally extends to the Hardy Boys' own womanizing, and it's through their connection to Klasha that Ruby ends up embroiled in the main plot. Similar to the smoker, there's an undeniable sadness to Ruby, forced to live on the fringes of society even before she's wrongly implicated in a murder, and tragically infatuated with a woman who doesn't seem to return the interest. That her encounter with the detective can go horribly, violently wrong, and that her future looks bleak even if she survives, only adds to this impression. Bleakness is to be expected in the world of Disco Elysium, but for these two characters, the game conveys their marginalization and isolation even in their intimate relationships without ever dwelling on their sexualities, because it's, again, something that the detective isn't properly equipped to process. <laughs> 
Kim has some good-natured fun at his partner's expense for this, because Kim has already come to terms with himself and is no stranger to contending with bigotry, but neither officer is in a position to do much for the other queer characters they meet. Because there are indeed several others out there in Martinez, and what's perhaps most remarkable, although not terribly surprising, is that the detective's overactive imagination is wrong on this point. There is no unified homosexual underground. No, ahem, <clears throat> gay agenda, if you will. The detective comes across other queer characters all over the political spectrum, who collectively have nothing in common apart from this single aspect of their identities that in some cases they struggle to even vocalize. We've already witnessed the sexually charged undertones of certain fascist interactions. In addition to those, Martinez plays host to an angry and deeply repressed royalist, a forward-thinking pair of student communists who express understanding toward the detective's relationship with Kim, and the smoker's Sunday friend, who turns out to be a high-ranking bureaucrat versed in the jargon of moralism, that is, status quo centrism. Kim is a moralist himself, although he's so detached from any sort of political discussion that his faith in the system is only maintained because he believes that any alternatives would be worse. Many of these particular interactions are in fact tied to the game's four political vision quests, underscoring that queerness is as much an inescapable reality of life as race or gender or class, and must be reckoned with regardless of one's own beliefs. Well, that's true up to a point. As if he recalled that he's in fact a decorated police lieutenant and not a naughty boy. The two aren't mutually exclusive. One reason that Disco Elysium garners as much praise as it does is for its strong and creatively implemented role-playing element. Even though its main plot is technically a linear one with a single resolution, the game's freeform approach to character building and its use of skill checks to determine the actions the player is able to take mirror systems more frequently seen in tabletop RPGs. The detective is by no means designed to be a player self-insert, and indeed his heavily layered backstory and wild behavior can make him difficult to identify with much of the time. Assigning skill points, internalizing thoughts, and wearing different equipment all enhance the detective's skills and bring certain voices in his head to the forefront, which has a substantial impact on the game's narrative. But there's only so much you're allowed to fundamentally alter about who he is. This places the detective's bisexuality in a category all its own when it comes to playable characters in video games, as it's technically opt-in. But it's never really absent, at least when compared with characters in other games whose sexual orientation is defined by which romance options the player chooses to pursue. As with virtually everything else about the detective, there's something intentionally unsettling about his sexual anxieties and the way they affect his interactions with other characters. Disco Elysium is not interested in ensuring that the player feels comfortable with its world and with the people in it even down to its stylized visuals and melancholy soundtrack conveying bleak, urban ruin. None of the openly queer characters the detective encounters seem to be better off for their self-acceptance, because it can be inferred that, as with everyone in Martinez, they're undergoing their own internal journeys that take them to places just as sad, and sometimes just as unhinged. Happiness and fulfillment in the world of Disco Elysium come in the small, personal moments encountered on such journeys. And hey, at the end of the day, this is a story about a middle-aged bisexual man battling depression and substance abuse with the help of a fellow police officer who also happens to be gay. Not many other games can claim anywhere near as much. Where's your homo, homie? What? It's not like that! They're what is called heterosexual life partners. They have a battle-tested relationship. A, a blood bond, if you will. There really isn't a grand thesis for Disco Elysium's queer content. 
At least not one that I can find. It's not one of those games that's ever going to be heralded as a hallmark of representation, or even wish fulfillment, but in a strange way, I kind of like that. Not to name names, but it can be difficult to find games with same-sex romances relatable when their worlds seem to lack any homophobia, or cis-heteronormative social pressures. Not every queer narrative needs to be traumatic or ripe for torture porn, but those prejudices are unfortunate realities of the world that we live in, and it can be refreshing to come across a game where characters face similar struggles and yet still come away finding some kind of happiness, even if it's fleeting, or it's not attainable by everyone, or it comes with a bunch of asterisks. In that sense, I believe that Disco Elysium is a game worth highlighting for pride, a celebration of sexual and gender identity that had to be fought for, and still must be fought for, continually. If, for whatever reason, you've made it to the end of this video and haven't played Disco Elysium yourself, I highly recommend that you check it out. It's an odd and jarring experience, and there's no way you're going to see everything your first time through. But based on my own time with the game, it's definitely worth it. Thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like and subscribe to the channel. I always enjoy analyzing queer content in the games that I play, so you can look forward to more of that when time permits. I hope everyone has a fun and decadent pride. Au revoir.